They're on vacation. They haven't had one in a long, long time. And in their stead, somebody's going to come and give us a word. And this, this guy, I call him my big brother. He's been a big brother of mine for many, many years. And I would like you to give him the respect and the attention because I know that God put something on his heart and he's going to bring it. Uh, this gentleman's name is Morris Pearson. And we love him. <clears throat> he's a funeral director. Do not go to sleep or you might get embalmed. I will take appropriate action. That's, That's right. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. All yours, Yeah, if we could have the children up here, please. Come on, kids. Come on up here. We're fixing to go to children's church, and we got to get you blessed first before we do that. Come on up here. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. I'm going to give you guys a history lesson real quick. This whole thing came together when we were at a planning retreat many, many years ago up in Klamath Falls. We saw this for the first time where the church prayed for their kids up here and everybody got in on it corporately. And ever since then, Pastor Dale said, wow, that's pretty cool. We need to start doing that. If you would, please, reach your hands up here. Stretch up over these children. Heavenly Father, we now give you these children for your instruction, Lord. We'd ask that you'd use mightily the people who are helping with these children. Let them receive something so that they draw near to you and will never depart. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Go get them, kids. Amen. Run. Have fun. <laughs> okay, I need a favor from everybody. Um, first of all, I was told when you speak publicly before people that you need to follow three simple rules. They're called the three B's of speaking. Number one, you need to be prepared, then you need to be brief, and then you need to be seated. So I've sat down. I hope that was brief enough. Anyway, here's what I need. Uh, when I'm done, I don't want us to leave until we do communion today. It is available. We need to do that today, okay? We need to do that. But I do want to deliver this message real quickly. And it's kind of a neat thing when you get ready to, to, to give a message. You start questioning yourself and you start talking with the Lord and you start going, you know, is that really what I'm supposed to do or is that not what I'm supposed to do? And this goes on and on and on and on. So I believe that I have a word today for someone in here, and this book is going to come completely off here. Hang on. It's going to stay. All right. So first thing we need to do is we need to find out where everybody is in their understanding of the word. Okay? So if you believe that the Bible has less than 100 books in it, raise your hand. If you believe the Bible has more than 50 books in it, raise your hand. So the magic thing is, hand goes up at 56, 66, there it is, 66, good answer gang, 66 books in the Bible. Each and every one of them has a message for us. Now, I'm going to teach you something that you may not have ever heard before, and that is, don't believe the person speaking necessarily okay where is the answer always in the Bible it is in the written word it is in Jesus Christ himself okay that's where the answer is all right I'm gonna back that up with a scripture Acts 17 11 if you have your sword with you pull it from the sheath and prepare to sharpen Seventeen eleven. I have four translations in front of me. King James, New International, New Living, and New American Standard. In this particular case, I'm going to read from New International. These all say the same thing, but I like the words that they use a little better. Sure I am. Here we go. Now the Bereans 
were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. I'm going to put it in Morris language. You hear me say something up here, or you hear Pastor Dale say something up here, or you hear Ernie Dixon say something up here, accept it. That's great. Listen to it. Write down. Take notes. You go to the book and you make sure that is correct. You do it. You are responsible for... That's right. You are responsible for... There you go. You're not responsible for me, but we know what we're saying here, right? We're responsible for our own education and belief, okay? We are accountable. That's another word to use. Accountable, okay? All right, here we go. If I was going to name this quick message today, I would name it one of three things. I would name it, Are You at War? I would name it, Run Out of the Rabbit Hole. Run Out of the Rabbit Hole. And the other one that I would name it is, I have no idea what to call this. Okay, those are the three names I would give to it. So, I want to start by saying sometimes we don't always do what's right as people. Now, I know that I'm probably the only one that has ever made that error, not doing what was right. I'll give you an example. At 143 miles an hour on a motorcycle, it's very difficult to explain to the officer that you didn't know what the speed limit was. Okay? Obviously, every person in here, and I don't care how old you are as long as you're over, you know, five or six, probably know that going hundreds of miles an hour is not the right thing to be doing. Anybody here ever done anything wrong? Just me. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. All right. Now, the reason I asked this thing about um, are we at war is because in the following scriptures, and I'm going to give you two of them because we want two witnesses on this. First is 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. So if you've got your book, let's flip down to 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. Or if you just want to be a little rebellious, go to 1 Chronicles 20 and 1. They tell the exact same story. Now remember, whose responsibility is it to check what I'm saying is true? It's yours. That's right. It's yours. So flip your book open and look. I'm going to tell you what it says, but I'm going to use my own language. I just want you to verify that what I'm saying is right. It is a story about when the season or the time comes to go out to war, when the kings go to war, David sent one of his generals to be in charge, and he stayed in Jerusalem. Now, some of us know the rest of that story. While he's in Jerusalem, he's hanging out, checking out the broads on the uh, rooftop next door, okay, and he gets himself in trouble, all right? That's the gist of both those scriptures. Once again, 2 Samuel 11, 1, and 1 Chronicles 20 and 1, okay? Now, would have David got himself in trouble had he been out at war like all the other kings? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? No, he would not have. That's correct. This is a participation sport, y'all. Okay? Just so you know. Well, that's you and Jens or y'all, depending on where you originally came from. Okay? It's a participation sport. Let's try it one more time. Yes or no? No, that's right. He wouldn't have gotten in trouble. Okay? Now, once again, had I not been going 130 miles an hour on a motorcycle, I wouldn't have gotten in trouble that day. Right? So I was obviously doing something that I shouldn't have done. Instead, I probably should have been reading my Bible, sitting at home, or holding a Bible study in my house. I should have been doing something that God would appreciate, right? Not out living for myself. I'm just saying, just me, okay? Not that anybody else has ever done that. Now, there's one other little thing you need to get here. Um, let's flip over to Genesis 1 and 14. First book of the Bible. Genesis 1 and 14. Again, I'm going to paraphrase it out in my own language, but I want you to verify what I'm saying is correct and accurate. 
And if at any time I get way off, just throw your hand up and stop me, please. I will correct myself. Because where is the authority word at? Is it in my mouth or is it in this book? It's in the book, absolutely. Okay, so God made the stars, the sun, and the moon to separate out times and seasons. Okay? One of the interpretations of this word seasons actually means divine appointments. So there will be signs in the heavens for divine appointments. And the quick example I would give you is the star arrives, the wise men see it, they follow it, and who do they find? Baby Jesus. Okay, there we go. So everybody's following this, right? Okay. Now, let's go up to Luke 21 and 11. And it'll take me just a minute. Because i got to read it four times because I have four translations in front of me. 21 and 11. Here we go. From King James. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. What's the connection to Genesis? Signs in the heavens. Okay? What did God make the heavens for? To show us seasons and times when stuff is happening. Now really, I'm going somewhere with this. Okay? Let's flip over uh, to 21 and 25. Same book. Let's just run down to 25. See if I can put my finger on it here real quick. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity, the seas, waves roaring. Am I correct in that? Is that what it says? Once again, Genesis, the first book, God is explaining why he made everything. He said, so there will be signs in the heavens, so that we'll know the times and the seasons. All right? And I'm just trying to get a couple of reference points here. Old Testament, New Testament, that's at least two people testifying, right? Or at least two places that we're getting the same information. All right. Let's do another one just to make sure here. Okay. Uh, let's go to Ecclesiastes 3.1. I used to have it in my book. There we go. Ecclesiastes, I'm going to read from, doesn't matter which four you pick, they all say the exact same thing. Here we go. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So, does scripture tell us that God is going to make appointments and he's going to draw them in the sky for us and that there is a time and a place for every single thing under the sun? I think that's pretty clear. That's just me thinking, though. You check it out. See if what I'm telling you is true. Okay. Let's move on here real quick to the book of Luke. Let's go the other direction. Mark Luke. Here we go. And in the book of Luke, we want to go down to the 12th chapter. And we want to start reading about verse 54. And I'm actually going back to a sermon that Dave, Dave, geez, Dale taught here just a couple, uh, couple weeks back, talking about a season and change that's coming, change that may already be in, in progress in our lives and in what's going on in this world. Here we go, 54. In my book, it has a little subtitle that says, Interpreting the Present Time. That's what my little subtitle says. And he said also to the people, When you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight away you say, There cometh a shower, and so it is. 
And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it comes to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern the time? Yea, and when even yourselves judge ye not what is right, excuse me, yea, yea, and when even you yourselves judge ye not what is right, when thou goest, goes, goeth, goes, there we go, it's goest, we then ad, adverse, adversary whew, to the magistrate, and on the way give diligence that thou may be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast you into prison, I tell you that there will be no departing from until the last penny is paid. Whew, that was a whole mouthful for me. Now, I know some folks can just roll that out, but I can't do that that easy. I think next time I'll try NIV. Here's why I bring that up. The interpretation of signs we're supposed to have. Jesus told the people, the disciples told the people, the prophets told the people, you should know what's happening. Around. And let me go off track very quickly and explain that there have been seasons and times through history. Okay? There was a time when we lived under the Torah. Okay? And when I say us, I'm talking about the religious followers of the one God, the creator of the universe. They lived under a thing called the law. We know all those stories. It starts about Adam, okay? Goes on up, law's given, Mount Sinai, right? Or wherever it is that it's given, on the mountaintop. We, we know all this. This is a time of scripture. Then we have another time, the time of the prophets and of the judges, okay? Another time in history. Then Jesus comes into the world, and now we live in what we call the church age, or the Messiah time, okay? It is a time, and we know that there is another time that is coming. We know that there's another time that's coming, okay? And here's what I want you to get. This is, this is really important. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 1 through 4. Now I'm going, to, I'm going to read this out of the NIV. Those of you that have King James in your hand, please follow through. You'll say that it says the exact same thing. For those of you reading the New Living Translation or the correct Jewish translation or the other, other translation, it will say the same thing. Here we go. Now brethren, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know well, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Going to sneak up on you, right? Is that what it says? Let's keep reading. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. Here comes the correction. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Now, I want you to get this. What he did not say is, it's going to sneak up on you and catch you. That's not really what he said. What he said is, you should already know when this is going to happen. You should be aware of the days, and you should not be caught like the thief. You should not be surprised like him. That's what's being said. This was so huge to me when I got my brain around this the other day. I just, I, I was floored and I needed to share this. There is a time coming and it's not very far down the line. And I know this has been preached for 2,000 plus years now. But Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming back. He's going to show up just the same way that they saw him leave. He's coming on a cloud. There's a hundred different interpretations of what the cloud is. It could be a fluffy rain cloud. It could be the cloud that was on Mount Sinai when the law was given. I don't know that yet. But what I do know is he's coming. 
and he's coming soon. And everybody sitting here knows that stuff ain't the way it was five years ago. And everybody here knows that it isn't the way it was 15 years ago or 30 years ago or God bless, we're old enough to remember 50 years ago. It is not the same. We do not do the same things that we did. We do not honor our parents. We do not tell the truth. We cheat, we lie. Anybody here ever cheated on their taxes? Be honest, don't raise your hand. But be honest in your heart. And it's okay because we now live in the time of what? Say grace. We live in a time of grace, so it's okay. God will forgive me. It was just a little slip. God is going to hold you accountable if you do it willingly. If you choose to do wrong willingly, knowing right from wrong, not the occasional slip and you go, oh man, I forgot. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the willful plotting of doing it wrong. You're in some trouble. Because when that time comes, that remnant that comes through the tribulation and is with him, it's going to be smaller than what we think. And I believe that wholeheartedly. It's going to be smaller than what we think. Okay, moving on. You should know. Now, I don't want to get off on a tangent where you get confused or lost, so now I want to switch over here real quick and talk to you about rabbit holes. Okay? There are rabbit holes in Scripture. All right? These are those things that you hear or somebody teaches and a single word or a thought catches your imagination and you run with it. You're like, wow, that's got to be it. And so you run with it. I'm going to give you an example. How many times is the word unicorn used in the Bible? No, that's not correct. It's used six times. If you read, if you read King James, the word unicorn. Now, are we talking about the little pink animal with the single doohicker up front that fairy dust falls off of and dances around with children? No. But the point is, the word is used. I'll give them to you real quick. Numbers 23, 22, 24, and 8. It's also in the book of Job, 39 and 9, and 39 and 10. It is in the book of Psalms, 29 and 6, and 92 and 10. It's in there six times. Guess what? Don't worry about it. It's a word, okay? Now, with that said, do words have meaning? Absolutely they do. You need to pay attention to words. But what I'm telling you is the word unicorn is a rabbit hole that you can run down and lose a whole bunch of time and energy on, all right? I'm using that as an example, okay? Just as an example. Let me share another rabbit hole with you. You'll like this one. Here we go. Here's a rabbit hole for you. It's cool, but it is not a theology that you want to build your entire life on. It is not where you want to spend your time focusing necessarily. All right? God. The word God means the God. The one. The creator. Okay? It's God. Do you know that Adam's name means man? Everybody know that? That's what a name means. Seth is appointed. He was appointed as a replacement. That's what the name means. So I'm going to run down through Adam, Seth, Enoch, Kenan, Mahalalah, whew, hope I got that right, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Here's what their names mean if you read them translated. The God man is appointed. A mortal man of sorrow is born. The glory of God shall come down instructing that his death shall bring those in despair comfort and rest. The gospel in the lineage from Adam to Noah. But again, that's a rabbit hole, so be careful of it, okay? Should we move on? Real quickly here, let's flip over to Ezekiel 22:26. I'm going to shift gears again. Now are you getting why this message also could have been, what do we call this? Okay, here we go. We are going to the book of Ezekiel. Oh, it's gone. No, it's not. There we go. Whew. That was scaring me for a second. I lost the book of Ezekiel. 22-26. Ezekiel 22 
26. Here we go. This is where I'm going to talk to you again. Could be a rabbit hole, could be truth. But I want to talk to you about people who speak to you. I'm talking about myself today. Okay? I'm going to put myself right in the middle of that seat. First of all, I told you earlier, you're supposed to receive what I say with gladness of heart and enjoy it and take what's good out of it. But what else are you supposed to do? Study it, make sure what I said was correct and accurate. Okay? Absolutely. Here we go. Let's see, what do I want to read this out of? Let's go New Living Translations, just for a giggle. Okay? 26. You priests have violated my laws and defiled my holy things. To you there is no difference, or to them there is no difference between that that is holy and that that is not. You did not teach my people the difference between what is ceremonially clean and unclean, and you disregard my Sabbath day, so that my holy name is greatly dishonored among them. He's talking about people teaching to the, to the people. Okay, Let me tell you what Ezekiel really says in this verse. It says that if we do not tell you the difference between that that is right and that that is wrong, we're lying to you and we're going to be held accountable. Okay? Number two. We need to tell you what is clean and what is unclean. In other words, what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. Okay? I know we live under grace, folks. But we don't even know that we need grace until we understand the law because that's what convicts us. Right? Knowing the difference between right and wrong lets us know that yeah, now I'm doing wrong, or, oh, yep, yeah, now I'm doing right. Okay? That's what's going on here. So, to those of us that speak to people, we need to make sure what we're saying is correct and accurate. Correct and accurate. When God tells me to do something, I better make doggone sure that that was God that told me to do it. Okay? I better make sure of that because if not, then I'm speaking on my own heart and on my own self and out of my own words. And do you know that I'll be found out? Do you know that? I can give you the reference points if you need it. Trust me on this one. Okay, anybody here think that I'm not being honest with that statement? Okay, moving on. Ezekiel says, that you need to be a leader in your own home. You definitely need to start teaching men to other men, ladies to other ladies, adults to younger, younger to even younger. You need to start teaching the difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean, law or against the law. You need to teach that. We need to know. Okay? We're getting really slack with that. Now, my question is, are you still in Jerusalem walking around on rooftops or are you making war? Are you fighting the good fight? Do you get up in the morning and put on a helmet that has what in it? What's the helmet? Somebody say salvation. Salvation. Do you put on your breastplate of what? Righteousness. How are you going to know you're right? Knowing the difference between right and wrong clean and unclean I'm using those terms because they're in the Bible but I hope you follow what I'm getting at okay we're going to gird ourselves up or hold the whole shoot match together with what what goes around our waist gird ourselves with what is it come on this is a test okay what are we putting on our feet Somebody say gospel. Shoot up with the gospel. Swinging what? For defense and for offense. The word of God. So do you get up in the morning and get yourself dressed every day with that? Because if you're not, you need to start. You need to start. You need to know that you have salvation. 
You need to know you're righteous. You need to know the difference between right and wrong. You need to gird yourself with truth every day. You need to tell the truth, even when it's not convenient, even when you look wrong. I work in the funeral industry for a living. When I make a mistake, people are very angry, okay? The quickest way to make that right is to tell them the truth. Hey, I blew it. I'm sorry, I spelled your name Karen with a T, okay? I have fat fingers, I slip when I type, all right? I did it, I will fix it and make it right for you. But it's hard because it's a stressful time in people's lives. So you need to learn to tell that stuff quick and fast, okay? Quick and fast, tell the truth, do it, and do it fast, all right? Now, you guys ready for, uh, let's see. Okay, let's see if I got this one right. Here we go. So, let's go to Matthew 5, 17, 18, and 19. Book of Matthew, fifth chapter. Matthew 5. Seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen. Five, seventeen. I'm gonna go back to King James. Because there's some folks that think that King James is the only version of the Bible that should be read. Doesn't matter if it's in Chinese or anything else, it should be King James. That was a joke, but that's okay. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Okay, now, this is where I get in trouble. Dale, if you're watching, sorry. Here we go. Jesus did not say that I have fulfilled the law. He said that I am here to fulfill, not fulfill the ED, but I am here to fulfill. That means to currently make it right. I'll give you the example here. Uh, Seattle Seahawks. Jim Zorn, many, many, many years ago, was the quarterback. He fulfilled the ED, that position. Today, Mr. Wilson is fulfill or fulfills that position, right? And 10 years from now, there'll be another quarterback there fulfilling that position, right? Okay, so what I'm trying to get at here, folks, is that the law has not ended necessarily, okay? But now we have grace and law. This is where it's starting to get introduced to us, okay? We still have to do the right things. That's what I'm trying to get at. We have to do the right things. We need to know what is right or wrong. We need to know what is clean and unclean, what is holy and what is unholy. We need to know these things. We need to know the first five books in the Bible. We need to know them. We need to read them. We need to use them. We need to use the last five books in the Bible. We need to know them and read them. And the rest of them in between, guess what we need to do? Know them and read them. Absolutely. This is formed precept upon precept and line upon line. It's like the cogs in a gear coming together. Let me demonstrate. That's how you get the whole message, okay? You don't, you, thank you. You don't just get one, you get the whole message, all right? Now, I'm gonna throw you one more quick rabbit hole and then we're gonna close, okay? And do communion. Here we go on the rabbit hole, you ready? 
In Matthew 27, 11 through 26, 11 through 26, we're talking about Jesus Christ himself with Pilate. The people are screaming and yelling, but it's a tradition to release a prisoner, right? To let somebody go during this time. And so the governor says, okay, I got this guy over here. He's an insurrectionist and a murderer. His name is Barabbas, okay? And if you read NIV, if you have an older copy of it, it says his name is Jesus Barabbas, just so you know that him and Jesus may have had, may have had, remember we're in a rabbit hole, the same first name, okay? But let's talk about what Bar Abba means. Barabbas, Bar Abba. Bar means son of, and what does Abba mean? Father, son of the father. Jesus Barabbas is the son of his father. Okay? The question is, which Jesus were you cheering for when you got up this morning or when you interact with the person who cut you off this afternoon? Okay? Or tomorrow when you see that person that flew before your eyes and there was nothing you could do about it? Who do you yell to be released into your life and upon your family and in your nation and in your place. Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the one and only true living God? Which one do you yell for? Okay, we're going to jump out of that rabbit hole real quick. I just wanted to let you know Barabbas means son of the father. You know, Jesus uh, actually kind of scolded some of the teachers and leaders at the time, said, you do what your father did. Well, who is he talking about? The devil, right? Who is the murderer and insurrectionist's father? The devil, right? Enough said. We're out of that rabbit hole, moving on. Just want to tell you that there's rabbit holes out there. Don't get caught up in them. Oh, wait, one more. I got to share this. I'm sorry. I can't help myself. If you go back to the book of Daniel, second chapter, second verse, and read it, through the second chapter 48 verse you will find out that all astrologers magicians soothsayers and and necrophiles or whatever the word is uh, uh, all those people that do what today we would call witchcraft and astrology you would find out that they were put under the charge of Daniel did you know that that's what the scripture says check it out if you got time want to dig in a rabbit hole for a while the point being is that there is a teach in Jewish history that says that the men who came from the east, the Magi, we've heard of them, right? The three wise guys, I mean the three wise men, okay? We heard about them. How did they know that the king was going to be born and if they went to that star, they would find him? How did they know that? In relationship to Jerusalem, where is Babylon? Would have they traveled that direction? You gotta think about this stuff. These are descendants or people who followed the Magi under the teachings of Daniel, who was very, very wise. Matter of fact, he was wise enough that he put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as his three underbosses. Y'all knew that, right? Once again, we might be in rabbit holes. I've seen some looks like, okay. Take time, check it out someday down the road. Here's the bottom line. They knew the season and the time. They saw what in the heavens? A sign. And they went to the appointed place and got the appointed results. And it's recorded in the New Testament for us to read today. They showed up. They brought at least three gifts. We don't know if there's three guys. We just know that wise guys came. Wise men, magi. They brought three gifts. That we do know. There might have been ten of them. There might have only been two of them. We know there was more than one because it's plural. That's all we know. All right? Let's get back to the beginning here so that we can bring this to close and do communion. Once again, are you being like David? Are you sitting in Jerusalem on your rooftop? Or are you putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, girding yourself up with the truth, running on the gospel, and swinging the sword of the Spirit every day? What are you doing?
That's the question that I have for you today. Dale said there's a change, a time, a season that's coming where things are going to change very drastically in this earth. So I'm going to give you one last rabbit hole. What I hope, I'm not promising, I hope is Genesis 1, 14. Let me tell you something that's going on here. On Passover of this year, okay, April 15th, for those of you that were paying attention, the moon turned to blood. They're called the blood red moons. There's a teaching out there called the tetra of the four, or the, the, the four blood red moons. Again, it's a rabbit hole. Let's not run down into it. But what I am telling you is that something miraculous happened in the heavens. Okay? On October 8th this year, this also happens to fall on a Jewish holiday. There's only seven of them, so the timing's pretty good. Sukkot, okay, on Sukkot, October 8th, 2014, again, we will have a full blood red moon. Moving on, in November, we are going to start seeing a comet in the heavens. Nissan 1. Anybody heard of it yet? If you haven't, look up. It's going to be the brightest comet that's ever passed within visual of the Earth. It's going to be so bright that we are going to be able to see it in the daylight. It's okay. It's not going to hit us. It's actually outside of the sun. Okay? So it's big. It's moving fast. And the trail is going to be bright enough we'll see it in the daylight. Also hasn't happened. Do you know what happens on Passover, April 4th, 2015? Blood red moon. Want to take a guess what happens on Sakat, September 28th, 2015? Blood red moons, okay? Things are happening in the heavens. I am not telling you that that means that Jesus is coming, because I don't know. What I do know is that the season is correct. It ain't going to catch me by surprise if he shows up this afternoon. Okay, that's what I'm telling you. I know the time, uh, the season, not the date, not the specific point. I don't know that. No man knows that according to Scripture. But we do know the season, we know the time, and things are changing. And it is so hugely important at this point right now today in your lives that you make this right between you and your creator. It is so important. It is so important. If I say it one more time, will somebody here get it? It is so important. It's so important. You need to make things right between you and your creator. You need to get into the word. You need to read it. You don't have to run off and join a commune and, you know, eat a certain diet or do this or do that necessarily. That might be a rabbit hole you want to look at, but not for today, okay? But he's coming. Scripture said he's coming. The prophet said he's coming. He's come once. If he did something once, will he do it again? Yes or no? Yes. Is he the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Yes, he is coming. There are things going on in the heavens. We need to wake up and look and see what the time is that we're in. We need to check our moral compass, and we need to look at others' moral compasses, and not judge ourselves as, are we as good as they are? Because guess what? They're rotten to the core, and you might be just as rotten, but think you're doing just fine. Okay? Where do you need to line up your compass with? Right there. It's right there. It's right there. It's right there. If everybody would, real quickly, please, just where you're sitting, if you just bow your head for just a minute, please, all eyes down, all heads down, I want you to check your heart very closely and just simply admit to yourself or not admit to yourself that you are lined up on the Lord's team, you're ready to go to battle against the devil and against the gunk of life, or are you going to stay in Jerusalem, sit on that rooftop, and watch? You check it out amongst yourself. And while we're doing that, you listen to my voice real quickly. We're going to move in and we're going to take communion. And one of the things we need to do is we need to do a quick self-evaluation. Where are we? Where are we? before we enter into fellowship with the Lord. 
Remember, they were in the upper room, and Jesus took the bread and he broke it up. And he said, guys, listen to me. This is me. This is my physical being, my body, that's going to be broken for you. It's going to be ripped to shred and torn up right in front of you. When you eat this, you're going to enter into a covenant with me. And after they'd done that, then he took the wine out. And there's another potential rabbit hole. Don't go down it. Okay? He took the drink on the table. And he said, this is the blood which is going to be poured out. This is part of this covenant. We call it taking communion today. We call it the sacraments. It's known by a bunch of different things. What it is, is it's you with a clean heart making an agreement, signing a contract with the Lord, saying, I am going to do what you did physically. My body's broken, so be it. I'm going to go until the last drop of blood's poured out of me with you. That's what that covenant is. His blood washed every piece of garbage that's ever happened to you or will ever happen to you away. It's done. It's gone. It's buried at the bottom of the sea. His name is Jesus, the Messiah. Yahshua. And when you're ready, and when you're ready, the communion table is set up. We'll have an usher over there to assist with you. But you just take a minute and make sure that you're ready to enter that covenant. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your own Lord and personal Savior, right now, just in your heart, say, Lord, I need to know you. I need you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my King. I want to follow you from this day forward. Father God, forgive my sins. I believe your son is who he said he is. And I now make that covenant. You are my God and I will follow you from this day forward. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for everything that you have done in my life, everything that you're doing in my life. I thank you for those cool people that have been put in my life. I appreciate it. Yes, I'm talking to you. I appreciate it. I love you, Lord, and I now turn this back over into your hands the rest of this day, week, and the rest of this season until we meet face to face. And amen, and amen, and amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Dale, and I want to thank you for joining our program today and also take just a moment to invite you to join our online community where you can get updates about upcoming events, maybe contact a pastor, submit a prayer request, or possibly join with us in praying for other requests. Every member here at Liberty has their own page on our site. Signing up is quick and easy. You simply go to our website, which is libertycf.com. In the upper left-hand corner is a button that says Online Community. You click on that button and it opens up the sign-up page. Simply put your name, your email address, phone number if you'd like, any additional comments you might have, or prayer requests. In the right-hand corner, there's a green button that says, Help Me Get Connected. Once you click that button, an email is sent out to your address. You simply open your email address, and there will be instructions helping you set up your own personal page. Hey, thank you for joining us. May God bless you.